Good morning. So, I'm trying out a new brand. We were driving here, and I said, Dad, what should I call my company? And you know what he said? He said, you're the doctor of social media. So if you like that, tweet me. If you don't like that, come up with something better. <laughs> so my history, I was a Forrester analyst. There I covered CRM and customer service. How many customer service people are here? A couple. How many marketers are here? Wow, OK. Well, you will know how much courage I had. As a customer service person, I actually went and worked in an agency because I had never sat in that role before. And in 2008, when I was doing social customer service, I thought, you know what? I bet people are going to use this channel to complain. And they started. And you also see some of my management consulting languaging here. Bunch of books I've either written, or people ask me to write chapters in, brands I advise, software companies. I work with a lot of software companies. My practice is split between brands and software companies. And as I've been working with companies, they say, hey, Dr. Nat, you know what? I'm confused. What I would really like to know is where am I on the social media continuum? I want to know, how do I do more of the right things? How do I put structure around this? How do I figure out where I am? And if I can figure out where I am, maybe I can make a strategy. Maybe I can make a plan. Maybe I can measure it. And maybe my boss would say yes. So, guess what I did? I made a structure. My PhD is in engineering, it's metallurgy. I turned lead into gold. That's my story, we're sticking to it. So I said, okay, if people are asking me this question, that means there's no structure. So, being an engineer, I thought, okay, let me build this. So I thought, well, let's figure out some sort of scoring method. So I made a scoring method of listen to optimize. And what I wanted to do was to take the chaos to order. So what people were asking me was, where am I on the social media adoption curve? How do I go to the next step? And how do I justify these next steps? So here's my seven-step process. If you want to take my class, what I'm teaching this summer online, so you don't have to come to LA. That's where I live. And what I thought was, if I create these seven steps, then there would be structure, and people would have a better idea of what it takes to actually do this well. And what I found when I started interviewing brands is everybody jumps to step five. They put up a Twitter, they put up a Facebook, they say happy Monday and buy our stuff, and then they say, hey, Dr. Nat, we can't find the ROI. So I said, aha. Well, maybe there's some things you need to do before you jump online. So let's take a look. This morning we've heard uh, return on influence, return on relationship. I love Sam, I love Ted, and I love Rick. And these guys are all right. If you don't focus on people, there is nothing that can replace that, whether it's employees or customers or advocates or influencers. And I believe that if you focus on the interaction and turn that into engagement, and you turn that into influence, and you turn that into a relationship, you can get to ROI. So I created this new thing, RI, RI. Creating all kinds of new things. I don't know if any of it's going to work, but you'll let me know. So let's look at step one of my process. Step one is gather insights. And when I was looking at this, I talked to a lot of executives, and they say, hey, Dr. Matt, don't tell anybody this. I'm like, I know you know. So they say, well, what is this social media? I see my kids posting on Facebook, my wife shares, you know, pictures, our family gets, you know, gets together. I was just, if you look at my Facebook page, we just had my brother's 50th birthday party. They posted 100 pictures. So I said, you know what? I've been in business a long time, and I think this is the most important change in business since the assembly line. I think it's a game changer because of what I call the witness factor. People are changing their behavior, some companies, because guess what? Just like cave paintings, what people say online is permanent and it's going to last a million years. 
So I asked him, let's, you know, I'll, I'll do some screenshots and I'll show them what people are saying. I said, well, don't try to just take that down. <coughs> okay, so there are some rules. And the rule is, if it's on your own site, it's bad form, right? Because then people will notice that you took it down and then they'll create a bigger PR problem. And most of the things that are said are not on own sites. So I'm like, well, what are we going to do about that? Well, one of the reasons I started a customer service was I think that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where customers use your product and give you feedback. So if you're a marketer, you can't sell things to people who are mad. So the very first thing you do is look at customer service and look at those CSAT scores. And some companies are looking and some are don't. And you know what? I won't even work with a company if they won't look at customer service because I don't want to develop a marketing campaign and have a blowout. So, if you haven't read, how many have read the Clean Train Manifesto? Okay, that's your assignment. I'm a teacher, and I want you to read this book. It was written in 1999, and I pull it out every class I teach, and I get double response. Because they said, in 1999, that there would be a place and a time and an enabling technology where the voice of the customer and the voice of the employee would make a difference. And we are here now. And when you read that book, you will think that they wrote a yes. So what's really interesting is that I grew up in the auto industry. I worked for General Motors. I call them General Motors because they sent me to graduate school. That's how I got to California. And my dad worked for Ford. And do you guys know who Deming is? He's a father of quality, so you guys remember. He was the one who said to the American auto industry, we need to change how we're doing things. And they said, no, we don't. So he went to Japan. 25 years later, the American public had to bail out the American auto industry. Maybe Deming had something right. So when I talk to executives, I say, look, People for many, many, many years have been saying, listen to your employees, listen to your customers. Take that information, integrate it back into your products and services, and guess what? You'll have a great company. And that is what social media is. So in step one, I ask companies, are you using any social media monitoring tools? It's not about the tool, it's about the feedback. Are you listening to the word of mouth of your employees or customers? Do you look at Glassdoor and see what people think about your company? Are you looking at your own sites? And the most important thing is what are you doing with that information? Probably nothing. What I found was most everything in a business, what's working, what's not working, what would be better of, could be found in social networks. Now what's interesting is, is there a structure in your organization to take that information and integrate it back in? So, that could be something you can think about, because that would give you job security in the right organization that's interesting. I have a, I'm kind of like Swiss cheese, I've died on many swords, so I warn you to be in a culture that appreciates feedback. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So best practices, what are your customers saying about your company? What are the seat sets for us? What would be better? And is there a way to take that information and integrate it back into your company? Best practices, you have a digital dashboard. It will tell you everything about your company. Some companies are actually creating this. This is from Dell. And they're actually using it for real-time decision-making. And the executives are actually looking. So I can remember 25 years ago when I started the call center, we would try to get CEOs to come and listen to the agent phone calls. They weren't interested. So we recorded them, and we played them in the meeting. And we're like, oh, that's terrible. We have to fix this. But when we said, here's what you have to do to fix it, they said, oh, not so much. 25 years later, people are posting online. It's like cave paintings. The world has changed. Okay, step two, creating a measurement program. So a lot of you who do follow me know I'm an ROI queen. It's one of my favorite topics, not because I love math or I'm so in love with all my dog. 
I'll tell you a story. When I was first, my first engineering job, I uh, was a GE car boy. We made tungsten carbide tool bits. Nothing exactly what I thought I was going to be engineering my first job, but it was a job. It was GE. I was doing a rotation, and I was sitting in a meeting with sales and marketing and engineering. And engineering was saying, "Make the white ones, the white ones. They're coated with aluminum oxide." And the sales and marketing people are saying, no, 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 it's the gold ones. They're selling them. So I raised my hand my first day. I thought, oh, I'm going to show them how smart I am. I'm going to make a difference. And I said, how many of our customers? They all started laughing. They were roaring. And they said, why would we do that? And I held back the tears. I excused myself. And I went to my boss afterwards, and I was like, because I have two tool bits. He was like, what do you want them for? I said, I'm going to do my own focus group. I'm going to go and ask the machinists here on 8 Mile in Detroit what they like better. He's like, I can't believe you're still on this conversation. But here, and clock out, because I ain't paying you for this. So I go to the machinists, and I say, which ones do you like, and why? Held out the white one, held out the gold one. Now remember, the white one is stronger, the gold one is strong, but not as strong. Guess which one they like? Raise your hand for white. Raise your hand for gold. You guys are right. And guess why? Now these are guys who have been machinists for 30 years. They loved the gold one. And this is the key piece. I said, why? And they said, because it makes us happy. <laughs> it makes us feel special. Really? And they said, Matt, look at the floor, look at the ceiling, look at our machines, they're great. That little tiny piece of gold makes us so happy. So then I thought, okay, customer feedback is really important, and proving that there's a return on investment is going to get the management's attention. So I went back, I told the CEO of my little focus group, and he came out with me. Now it wasn't easy because my boss was not very happy with me. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> so what's the issue with measurement, right? So we measure the wrong things, we drive the wrong behaviors, like paying for lights or trying to reduce average handle time in a call center, which means to add three minutes and 50 seconds, usually the customer service agent is trying to hang up on you, because if they go to four minutes, they get dinged. For social media, we have, many people have not figured out social media attribution, and they don't know how to measure social media. So what I see in the social media streams is people are saying, did you calculate the ROI of a phone? Are putting your pants on in the morning? Or your mother? And so while these are funny and cute, and I really do believe that the people who are saying these things truly believe that social media is so obviously important that it's as important as having a phone, it won't make your boss happy. <coughs> I believe that there's an ROI of anything that has value. And here's an uh, infographic that somebody made the ROI of mother. So, very cute, right? So why do we care about ROI? Well, I would guess that all of you in this room are innovators and early adopters. If you've never seen this curve, another book for you to get is called Crossing the Chasm. It's written by Geoffrey Moore. And what he said was that at the very beginning of any new thing, there's innovators and early adopters. And there are the people who adopt new things. That's us. But for things to go further, and this is where we are, we're basically in the third way. See that big green part? That's the largest part of the curve. That's most people in corporations. So if you're proposing things in your corporation and you're getting, sure, we're going to do that, absolutely. It's because the pragmatists, these are the majority, they don't get it. And they want you to show them the bottom line. So what I said was, what if we had a fast track? What if we had a scorecard? What if we had a report and actual steps? And that's what I created. So what it does is it actually helps people figure out where they stand. It gives them structure. And what I also found was they're very perceptive to recommendations, because now they have context to where they are. And what they realize is, they're kind of in kindergarten about doing social media. 
So this process basically <coughs> answers all the questions that your boss is having. Like, what's the value of social media? Is it affecting my business? Are we doing it well? What is well? So at the end of the talk, I'll give you my URL. There's three videos on there about social media ROI. I would send them to the link and tell them that it can be calculated and they need to get with it. So the point of social media, like the marketing, right? So here's typical marketing measures. We are either increasing revenue or decreasing costs. That's all there is in business. So for marketing metrics, there are some of the fluffy ones like positive sentiment, share of voice. But what we're really looking at is lead conversion rates and sales and the things that Sam and Ted and Rick talked about, which is the loyalty brand advocacy of referrals. And I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. For customer service, it's really about reducing uh, calls and increasing customer staff. So how would you calculate ROI? Cost is easy, right? People process the technology, buy the technology, you add up the people time, maybe there's some process. It's the benefits that gets everybody. So, here's how I describe this at a very high level. What if you created products and services with input of social media with your customers, with your employees? You'd actually be creating products and services that people wanted. That would reduce your cost of PR and marketing. It would increase your lead conversion rates. It would increase sales. And these things are all trackable. It would reduce churn and returns. And it would increase customer lifetime value. What you need to know about that is how much does someone spend today with you? So let's say they spend $100 and they buy from you once. What you want to do is you want them to buy from you at $100 and next year at $120 and you want them to buy for 10 years or forever. And why does that happen? That happens because they're happy with the products and services and because you've taken care of them when they have problems. What I also found when I was doing my research was that employee attrition went down. Why? Because employees feel heard and they're making a difference. And they have an experience where the boss and the whole table is not laughing at them. It's like they're having to be a GE. And employees are going to be increased. Because what's really interesting, and last night I got this little necklace, says love on it. I'm wearing my heart out there for everybody to see. And what's really important is to know that that relationship, that influence, that's what's going to make a difference. When people and customers feel like they're heard and they're getting what they need, they return. And it's really that simple. So what I think social media is, is the opportunity to create a new kind of consciousness in corporate America. And so I help companies measure it, and we make dashboards. All right, so now let's look at, so best practices here, just like Rick said, the objectives and the goals, build your business cases, set up your metrics. Look at efficiency and effectiveness, reduce costs and increase revenue. Finding your audience, that's step three. Most people haven't identified that they're actually creating relationships. They just see customers, and I've been in many companies and say, oh, well, you know, we can just get more customers, right? It costs more to acquire new customers than taking care of the old ones. And a lot of times companies haven't identified their key audience members, their influencers, their advocates, their brand ambassadors their customers, the press, their partners. And they don't have a way to really drive great customer experiences. And with social media, there's no excuse anymore. So here's a really good example of the 12th course. And as Rick said, it's really important to create a brand persona. Who would that brand be if, they were, if the brand was a physical living thing? Because that's how you create genuine, authentic, and human. And the 12th force is a collective force of Best Buy technology pros offering tech advice in tweet form. So it's really clear what they did. So best practices about finding your audience, figure out your social identities and your 
customers, your influences, your brand advocates, make sure that that's matched up in your CRM system. And if it's not, then you're not using the right system. Three, four years ago, it wasn't really possible to do that. It is now. So you need to be able to identify a phone number, an email, and their social ID, so that now you can start to give attribution to the people that, let's say, someone complained on Twitter, and you save that. You need to be able to look at that call record and look at their social handle and see that you've made a difference. And you really want to make sure that you're studying the biases, the values, the psychographics, the motivations, and use that information when you're interacting with them. And I'll show you in the next step why that's so important. Best practices are creating galvanizing experiences so that you get that return on influence, that return on relationship, that return on investment. And also, so if something happens to the brand, then people come to the rescue. So I was working with my friend Ashley, she works for Proactive, and built that's you know, it's a solution that helps you if you have acne. That's a really hard thing to tweet about, right? She did an amazing job. She created this app, so if you had a picture and you had a purple, you could erase it. It's like fun, it's silly, right? But people loved it. So she had this great following, and then one day, Something happened. If someone was tweeting something absolutely horrible. She's like, Dr. Matt, I don't know what to do. Help, help, help. And I said, sit on your hands. She's like, oh, come on. Seriously? You usually give me the best advice. This is crazy. I said, wait, wait, wait 30 seconds. And guess what happened? The brand advocates, the influencers, they came to the brand's rescue. And they said, oh, that happened to me. Here's what you do. It's no problem. This is still a great problem. When you have that, you've created real relationships. Okay, step four, and I know I'm going through this really fast, you can have the slides. Creating content. So if you don't know who your audience is, if you don't know what they're passionate about, you cannot create content that's relative and relevant to that audience. So one of the reasons you can kind of see my steps now, right? You want to figure out what's going on. Two is set up what are our business goals, what are we trying to do? Maybe we're just trying to start and figure out where we are as a baseline. Or maybe we're a little bit more sophisticated and we're going to measure some things. But we need to know our audience so we can create the right content, so the content is interesting. So what's happened with content, and this is the evolution. Some of you are too young to remember this, but I do remember big frames. And what's happened with data is, you probably heard the expression big data. It's because everybody's sharing everything. Every piece of pizza, every margarita, and I'm not trivializing it because I do it too, right? Um, but what's happened now is people are sharing 3.5 billion pieces of content per week. That's a whole lot of sharing and a whole lot of content. And what most brands realize now that they got into social media is they're content creators and content publishers. And that takes a lot of energy and a lot of time. So if you really look at engagement, engagement is sharing content. Status updates, posts, videos, pictures. So what you want to know is, is my content driving engagement? And many people don't know what they don't know. So one of the things I do, and one of the reasons I work with a lot of technology companies, this is an infinite graph, is that the technology is now here to help us. So I like cosmetics. I said to Chase, who's the CEO, I want to do a report. I want to play with your technology. So I looked at the top 15 cosmetic brands. And here's how they rank in social engagement. Olay and CoverGirl at the top. So what the graph does, basically, you go to the site, you put the brand's names in, and it crunches all this big data. You don't really have to do anything, which is nice. The machines are pretty smart now. And what you can see here is Elf Cosmetics. And I didn't know if Ted was going to talk about that. It's kind of interesting, synchronicity. So Elf Cosmetics has the most Facebook posts. You can also measure Twitter and other channels. But look at where they are engagement. Post volume does not equal engagement. This machine also tells you what day of the week to post, what time of day to post, 
And it, you can actually look at the content. So let's say you want to look and see what cover post is posted. What is so fascinating? And you can click on it and you can actually see the post. So if you're a cover girl, you can go out and see what really worked. And if you're a competitor, you can go and see what your competitors are doing. And what I found with most brands is they cannot create all the content they need. It's expensive, it takes time, and so what you need is some sort of hyper curation strategy. So with this app, what you can do is you can actually repost other people's content. Now, of course, you're not going to post your competitor, but if there are this content that is similar to what your fans love, you can use various meetings, a whole bunch of buddy media involved in this week to be able to use that as your hyperfiguration strategy. The other thing that you can do with this is you can look at brands that are shared, let's say, by cover girl fans. So what's interesting is Walmart and Burberry have the same fans. And what this tells you is, if I was going to put an ad for cover girl somewhere, I might put it on a Walmart. So what you can see now is that technology is helping us to be really smart about content. And we can make very, very strategic decisions. Because we know our audience, we know what they like, we created our brand personas, and now we're studying not only our own content and looking at how engaging it is, but we're also studying our competitors. So best practices on creating engaging content Assure that the content delivery is consistent with people engaging and entertaining compared to your competitors. It's no longer to not know what you don't know. And the other little pet peeve for me is make sure it works on PCs and Macs. I know this sounds really silly, but last night when I was at the hotel and I was logging in on Firefox on the Mac, I could not get to the little button to click to get onto the Wi-Fi. I love Hyatt. Fix your website. <laughs> Step five, design sticky interactions. So if you want to really create sticky interactions, you can't just use Facebook and Twitter. You're going to need apps. What's great about apps is they allow you to measure. They allow you to measure everything. So if you're on Facebook, you get a little bit of data. But if you use an app inside of Facebook, you get everything about that customer. So now you have your social identity, and you can map that to your CRM system, and a lot of people don't know this. And the reason this is important is there's a new wave of brand building. Brands are social experiences, or they must become a social experience. So in the old days, a brand was their logo, it was a saying, and today brands are everything that they share and their personality, and their persona. And so a lot of brands, you can see some of them have really great personas, and some don't. And so the question is, how well developed is your persona? And what is the social experience of your brand? And you also have to remember that social media is always open, it's deeply personal, and it's inherently social. And I think, I think it was Ted who said, what's the best social media book? It's Del Carnegie. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It's about relationships, it's about people, it's about connecting in a constantly evolving ecosystem. So typical marketing funnel, right? We're talking about interactions, awareness, consideration, intent, purchase, and stuff. And this is the typical marketing campaign, right? So we go get customers, we get them interested, they like our stuff, they buy some stuff, and then it's over. And then we go and we do it again, which is a whole lot of work. So what if we had a system that actually allowed you to go through the <coughs> consideration intent, purchase, but it added the loyalty, advocacy, and referral? And what if you put every single marketing campaign into this perpetual motion machine? You would be creating an amazing group of people who didn't just like your page because you gave them a coupon. It's called like gating. So a lot of companies, what they were doing was they say, like our page, and we'll give you a coupon. And when I was talking to Edelman, we were working with them, and they said what they see is coupon farmers. So 
to keep on practicing. Run, stab, the keep on, and then run away. So you get this big spike of what looks like interaction, and then they go away. And mostly they use their hotmail email addresses, so you can't really unmark them to them. So we need a new system. Why does this work so much better? Edelman and many other people have said it's because people trust people. So we're back to the relationship, we're back to the influence thing, right? If I say something's good and my friends see it, they go, oh, Dr. Matt looks pink. If she said the pink store is good, it's probably good. So that's what brands have to understand. And, you know, there's it's all big statements like uh, the customer is what the brand is and slogans and PR campaigns are no longer important. I don't know if that's completely true, but I do know that you have to pay attention to what the customer is saying. And especially, I mean, how many of you have gone to Amazon or Yelp, read a review, and not bought something? Right? And what companies don't realize is that we're going there, we're reading it, and we just go away. We vote with our feet, but they never know we were there, they never know we read it, and they don't realize they're losing business. So if we're doing that in our personal lives, that is happening to your business. The other thing that's really important about interactions and using some system that gets around some of the issues is edge rank. How many of you guys know what edge rank is? Edge rank is an algorithm. When in 2010, when Facebook first started letting brands on, brands were posting so much content because they were so excited that it felt like spam in the news feed. So what Facebook did was they said, we're going to create an algorithm and we're going to use three variables, affinity, weight, and time decay, which basically says, I'm going to let stuff through on your news feed based on how many times you interact with that person. And what most brands don't know so maybe they wanted to, maybe they understand their customer, maybe they really understand their audience, and maybe they've created great content. But what they don't know is that 3 to 20% of the content is getting through, which means 80% of your content is not being seen. Not. And here's a quote from the head of advertising at Facebook. He says, if you want to speak to the other 80 to 85%, other people who sign up to hear you, sponsoring posts are important. But if you use an app, you can get around that if it's a customer to customer sharing app. So if you had a system that continually engaged your tribe of highly targeted, avid, passionate brand ambassadors, influencers, and customers, and they kept sharing your message, and you kept growing your tribe, then you would have the holy grail of social media, which is word of mouth. And there's a company that comes to mind, Zappos. Zappos went from zero to a billion dollars in 10 years. And every company I talk to that isn't Zappos says, Dr. Matt, please don't compare us to Zappos. We're not them. My response is, why wouldn't you want to be? Why wouldn't you want that success? And I said to Tony, I said, how did you do that? And he said, Dr. Matt, in a world where customer service is awful, we decided that would be our revenue generator. That we would provide the best customer service on the planet, and that would create word of mouth, and it worked. So here's an example of a CPG company, a large beverage company, that used this app. It's called Bamboo Engine. Yes, I've worked with them. Full disclosure. And I worked with them for the um, In four days, they had 2,000 ambassadors, and I'm not just talking about likes. I'm talking about avid, avid fans. Over six months, what you can see is that the ambassadors grew to 35,000. Results? So the blue line is the Facebook page at the same time. Same ad, same information. And the green line is the app. 33 exit and content views. And 85 impacts in page views. Why? Because the blue line represents the brand sharing and the content not getting through or customers not trusting the content. And the green line is ambassador sharing with friends. 
Step five, stop the politics. This is one of my favorite topics. In many companies, there's no established personnel model, group task force, or rules about who should post and how should you post. And we've seen a lot of issues happening, G and other companies that got in trouble. So one of the things that's really important is to get beyond this idea that there's an individual who's taken it upon themselves to be the person who's interacting with the customer in social media. And I applaud people like Morgan and Jeff Blue and Frank, Frank uh, Comcast when he was there, because somebody had to step up to the plate. And I asked Frank, why did you do this? And he said, Dr. Nutt, I was so embarrassed by what people were saying about Comcast, I couldn't take it. I couldn't not respond. And that's what most of us feel when we see it. But the question is, does that work on a larger scale? So best practices would be conducting some sort of social media readiness assessment. Is your company really ready? What kind of structure? Is it one of those structures where marketing and PR control it? Does customer service control it? Do you work as a team? Do you have a way to triage issues off the Facebook page? Again, you can't sell to people who are mad, right? So you need to get that customer service stuff off the Facebook page. And one of the things and the reason that I went to an agency was because I really wanted to understand marketing and PR and sit in that role. And there we managed 50 Facebook pages. We had more eyeballs than Larry King had viewers. It's a lot of eyeballs. And I really wanted to understand and appreciate their role. Because I come from customer service and those two departments don't talk to each other. In fact, sometimes they even hate each other. I'm not exactly sure why, but they do. So cross-functional collaboration. I was always told I was the glue in an organization, and that's never been appreciated. But I think now, being the glue is going to be an amazing piece on my resume. Because I'm going to be the one to go and talk, hey, how can, how can we get that stuff off your Facebook page? Marketers are like, you know how to do that. I'm like, yeah, you can just get satisfaction. And I'm like, wow, thank you. Appreciate that. The other thing that's really interesting is looking at Gen X and Gen Y and Gen Z. So I'm at my sister's house for Thanksgiving. I'm in the basement. He's upstairs. And he sends me a text. And he says, Aunt Nanny, dinner's ready. I'm like, hmm. I walk up the stairs. I'm like, Nick, can I ask you a question? He goes, sure, Aunt Eddie. I said, how come you sent me a text about dinner? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, in the old days, you know, Tanya, my sister, would just say, dinner's ready, get up here. Right? He said, I still don't know what you mean. I said, you could have just yelled down the stairs. Why did you send me a text about dinner? He said, Aunt Eddie, if I could send you a text, why would I yell down the stairs? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I'm so old, and I viscerally got it in my body that this new generation is different. Yes? You should give him Ted's phone number. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, it's also funny, too, because I'm on the West Coast. He's on the East Coast, and it's like maybe 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm supposed to be on Facebook, and he sends me a, a chat and Gmail, and he says, and then I think we're going to get in trouble. I'm like, fine. He goes, I see you posting on Facebook. I go, what do you mean getting in trouble? He goes, well, that is not like play. I said, oh, no, that's my job. He's like, I like my job like that. <laughs> you have to get A's in math and science. <laughs> so the point here is that millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, they grew up with being connected. They don't know not being connected. But they have different boundaries than people in the boomer, which is my age bracket. So they may not know that it's not a good idea to post their wrong pictures on their Facebook page <laughs> or whatever it is that they're doing. And companies, recruiters are looking at those things and not hiring people. It's really, really important. So best practices. At minimum, you want to figure out this organizational management thing. But you also want to create some sort of digital defense program. So that if you do have a disaster and you have dark sites ready and you can populate them and you can defer the damage. 
iterate and pivot. So in this I took a step, I work with a lot of startups. I work with a couple of uh, VC funds. And it's really important to pivot and iterate, and that's what really good startups do. And what it means is you want to constantly look at what's happening in your business. And if it's not going well, change. <coughs> do it in a different direction. But what most organizations do, there was some sort of saying like, well, it takes a really long time to turn a big ship. And you're sitting there as an employee, and you're watching something stupid happen. And when I teach uh, change management and leadership, I give everybody in the room a little tiny book with a pencil. And I say, every time you see something stupid happen in your organization, make a little tip in your book. And people start laughing, and I say, but Dr. Matt, my book would be filled up in a week. So there's this thing, this culture that happens in corporate America where somehow stupid things happen. And what social media is doing, if a company's really truly paying attention, is those things come to light, and that's why it's a game changer. And that's why I call it the witness factor. So you want some way to be able to look at what's happening. Best practices, customer service, marketing, PR, product development, engineering, manufacturing, or management, and executives would be one big happy family. They'd have this digital dashboard. They'd be talking together. They'd be making real-time decisions. I don't think I would see this in my lifetime, unless I lived to 200. But it would be, it's a good goal, right? It's where companies should and need to go, especially to survive. We'll see if that happens. And if you had some sort of scorecard, then you could see where you were and see where you need to go. And to be able to start to become agile corporations. So, my motto is you can't get there unless you know where you are. Try to figure out some sort of scoring process and figure out what your customer experience capability calculator is. Also, check in with employees and figure out where they are. So, social media just isn't externally focused, but it's also internal collaboration. And I can give a whole talk on that. If you had that information, you would be in a leadership position with clear direction, a clear voice, and definitely a competitive advantage. Thank you. Dr. Nett? Yes.